Hello you guys and welcome to my channel. I'm so excited to have you here. So in today's video, we are going to be doing another Where Are They Now interview. So this is a series I started in December of 2021 and I call it my Where Are They Now series. So I have been interviewing ex-MLM reps and me personally being someone who's an ex-MLM rep, it has been very interesting to speak with individuals who have left MLMs and really seen the truth about what goes on in MLMs. So I am very excited for today's guest. And this person today got into the top top 2% of the MLM beach body. If you guys know, I was also in the MLM beach body. So I am very, very, very excited to interview this person because I feel like it'll be very interesting. The fact that we had both been in the same MLM, we can really have a lot of conversations about maybe things that we both experienced. Today's definitely one of my most exciting interviews I've done. So with that being said, let's get straight into our Zoom call. Hello, you guys, and welcome to today's interview. So I'm first going to start off with asking, who are you? And then what MLM were you in? Kind of like the mini little background story that you have. My name is Nicole and I was a beach body coach for five and a half, six-ish years. I don't know, over five years. Um, the last two and a half of those years, I was a full-time coach. It was my only job. I was a lifetime one-star diamond coach, um, which means I've just created one other diamond underneath me. I was a hardcore very dedicated coach for the majority of that time. Actually, I, I took it back. I started out as a customer, had no plans on coaching. I had an unusually easy start to my coaching career. And as I started seeing like paychecks coming in, I decided to pursue it more and more seriously. And then I would say of those five years, three and a half of them were like serious Mm -hmm. I'm building business. And you said before we hopped on the interview that you actually became a personal trainer while you were in Beachbody. I think a piece of me always knew that it was kind of weird and kind of not right for random unqualified people to be running fitness challenge groups every month. So I honestly, the, the more I think about it and the more that I've like learned from the anti-MLM community, the more I just realized like what a state of cognitive dissonance I was in for the majority of that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I became a personal trainer because I thought that it would like validate me more. It would give me more credentials and like give me credibility, add credibility to what I was doing, even though I was still recruiting people who weren't certified personal trainers. So, so how did you get recruited into Beachbody? What is your story on how you got in? Yeah. So I am what many would call like a, a dream coach. No one really had to ask me to be a coach. There was like a family friend who this is back when Beachbody still had DVDs back in like 2015, 2016, 2015, end of, end of 2015. Beachbody still had DVDs. She was doing 21 Day Fix. She asked if I wanted to do it with her. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll, that looks cool. I'll try it. But, you know, I'm going to do 21 Day Fix Extreme. Like, give me the extra ones. That, and she like, mentioned coaching. And I'm like, no, it's not my thing. I've got school and all these other things going on, but totally down for the challenge group. And then a few weeks, like, Two weeks into the program, I started noticing really great results. I felt awesome about my body. And I was like, yeah, like, this is pretty sick. Like, go ahead and sign me up as a coach because I'm definitely going to keep buying the products and I might refer a couple people, but like nothing serious. And then when I wanted to become a coach, I actually didn't want to sign up with her. I didn't know how any of it worked. Like, I didn't know like, mm -hmm. the matter I signed up with. So she added me to like, a couple sneak, sneak peek groups. So I started following her upline and then her upline's upline and... I, I saw the uplines upline. I'm like, I want her to be my mentor. Like, not you. <laughs> and so I reached out to both uplines. I'm like, hey, so-and-so has asked me to be a coach. You guys look way more successful. Like, should I sign up with you? And both of them were like, no, go ahead and sign up with her. And like, again, that also should have been a red flag. Like, why, why did they want me to sign up with the less successful coach. Why do they not want me to sign up with them? Because they need her to like, yeah, <laughs> rank advance and get people under her. Through a weird, a crazy chain of events, eventually the top upline did eventually become my upline because the girl who signed me up, shocker, stopped working the business like shortly after. Um, and then her upline left for Prove It, which was a whole mm. scandal in itself. And then um, actually my original upline, she didn't quit. She just like went inactive. So I was still underneath her. Mm -hmm. And then around the time that we were launching into the UK, my, the top upline was like, Hey, like you're about to go diamond. Like, I wish you were counting towards my elite points <laughs> so that I could qualify for elite. And I'm like, yeah, well, so we were, so we actually went to London for the launch 
Mm-hmm. Um, and while I was in London, I called my personal up, like my directly sponsored upline. I'm like, hey, can you quit so our team can go elite? Because <laughs> that's how invested I was. And like, what? I, this is, and this is part of the reason why too, I think I have such a hard time sharing my story because I'm having a really hard time differentiating between like what were real, real, real relationships and real friendships and what were just because of the MLM and like, did the real friendships ever exist? And that's the part that still just like fucks with my head quite a bit because she became my best friend. Like we became mm. best friends. She made of honor my wedding. Like we've been through a lot of things together. And so looking back, I'm like, did me helping you go elite, did that just like buy my friendship with you? And I still haven't like wrapped my head around that. So are you guys, if, you don't have to talk about this if it's hard <laughs> for you to talk about. Um, are you guys friends today? Like to this day, how did she kind of react when you sort of started thinking about leaving Beachbody or kind of drifting away from Beachbody? So the reason I started drifting away from Beachbody initially was because I eventually crashed. Like I was go, go, go. Once I decided I was going to make this my full-time thing, I was like, all right, like pedal to the metal. Like I like printed out the business activity tracker into like a binder, like a spiral bound notebook. And mm-hmm. I pulled it out every day and I didn't 10X anything. I 100 times everything. Like I was a psychopath <laughs> and I was super manic for like two years straight. I would literally stay up for like over 24 hours straight, just inviting the entire time. Like when I tell you, like I'm psychopathic. And then I found out later that I was bipolar and I was manic for most of that time. Eventually, like once I became a full-time coach and started working exclusively from home, um, because originally I worked 12 hour night shifts in a hospital. Then I would come home, work my beach body business sometimes until I had to go to work the next day. And so Mm -hmm. I'd be up for 24 hours straight, just working. Um, Or sometimes I would come home, work my business, take a little nap, then get up and go to my job until I made it full time. But once I went full time, I was forced to slow down because I didn't have to get up and go to my job anymore. So mm-hmm. at first I'm like, yeah, I can sleep, I can relax. But all that like mania just came crashing and I went to this really deep, dark depression. And we were on a success club trip actually after I'd gone uh, full time into coaching and everyone's having a good time, you know, drinking, partying, all the things. And I spent a significant amount of time in that trip crying in my cabin because I was my body was in so much physical pain and like I was so depressed and I couldn't figure out what was going on I thought I had like a food intolerance or like some sort of hormonal thing going on like I I did not know what was going on and so the final night of the trip we're all our team are we're having dinner together and I just like started breaking down crying I'm like you guys I'm not happy I don't know what's going on there's something not right with me and like I just like trigger warning (laughs) mental health crises I was like I just I I just don't want to be alive. I'm so like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And so my upline who had also struggled with some serious mental health issues in the past was like, okay, we're going to get you help. We get back to the States and in the state that we live. And um, I think we had like a super Saturday shortly after that, a couple of us went up to my upline's house and kind of the same thing. We're after, after super Saturday, we go back to her house and we're just hanging out, like making TikTok videos, dancing, drinking and whatever. And I just get like super drunk and then start crying and just have another breakdown. And then my upline, she was like, okay, enough is enough. Like you're not okay. You're going to stay here. And I lived in a different state. I lived four hours away. She's like, whatever else leaves, you're going to stay here. And we're going to get you checked into a psych hospital. I was like, okay, like. I don't know how to do this. She's like, I went to a really great place. We're going to get you there. Uh, they have a partial inpatient program. So you go there all day, but you come, you can come here and sleep at night. So you're not like sleeping somewhere scary and unfamiliar. And the doctors are really great. They're really going to help you figure out what's going on with you. I'm like, okay, cool. That's awesome. So I stay there for a week, do the partial inpatient program. She helps me get set up. And that's when I found out that I was bipolar and that for the majority of my business leading up to that point, I was just manic and I was able to do things because my judgment was clouded. Like I, I had very little impulse control. I had like no impulse control. I didn't care what other people thought of me. I didn't care if people thought my business was stupid. I didn't care if people were annoyed by my posts. I didn't care if people were annoyed by my Hey Girl messages. And in fact, I hired an assistant so we could double up on the Hey Girl messages. And mm-hmm. I just, I did not care. All I cared about was doing the exact formula of the work that it was going to take to make me successful. And if I were successful, then that would wipe away anything cringy or ridiculous it took for me to get there. So I find out that I'm bipolar, I get 
put on medication, I learned a lot about myself and it was super helpful. Like again, so this is why I love hate relationship with the MLM because my upline saved my life at that point. Yeah. Um, genuinely, because if I hadn't gotten help, I don't think I'd be here. So like on one hand, I genuinely do like owe my life to her for like helping me through that. But I'll, I also, and I, and I don't blame her for anything. I don't, I'm not, I don't like hold anything against her because I also know that Beachbody is her livelihood, her family's livelihood, and they live a very comfortable life because of Beachbody. And so I, I think she's just as much of a victim as anybody yeah. else. But yeah, once I got well and was on medication, it was no longer manic. It literally became physically impossible for me to go back to working the way I was. I couldn't mm-hmm. even like in my right mind consciously post any of the things I've been posting before. Um, I also gained a lot of weight really quickly. Um, so I also found out like, I'm not just bipolar, I had eight, bipolar ADHD and I was um, struggling with an eating disorder. So I learned all of that at the same time. So the medications that they put me on controlled the mania. Mania makes it very easy. Mania plus Adderall for ADHD makes it very easy to not eat, to not yeah. crave anything. So, and to just like move nonstop. So yeah. now I'm slowing down. I'm on my bipolar meds, like my mood stabilizer. So no extreme highs, no extreme lows, just mm-hmm. like even. And it felt super weird at first. Um, and I gained a lot of weight very quickly. Like I've since gained about 70 pounds since being a coach. So like traumatizing gaining yeah. weight as a coach, like uncontrollably. Like I was trying to like not get back into like restrictive food habits, mm-hmm. but also I couldn't work out as often and as obsessively like I had in the past. And I also couldn't like starve myself like I had in the past. It was just a weird thing. It was, it was so, it was a, a weird mind fuck because on one hand, like my mania and my depression were under control and my mental health in one area was like feeling great. Mm-hmm. And then I was rapidly gaining weight, which is then triggering my eating disorder and triggering like all of my unhealthy eating patterns and body dysmorphia through the roof. And so then it became hard. Like I felt like a fraud. If I posted anything about health and fitness on social media, it's like, well, I'm gaining weight. Like I'm not even like, I, who am I to tell people how to lose weight, which I can't even maintain my weight. So then I basically for 2019, I took the year off of like actively working my business. Um, this is going to sound shitty. It's going to sound real shitty. I almost never worked my business. I still got paid though, because I had Mm. a virtual assistant who worked my business for me who would start conversations with all of my followers and anyone that watched my stories mm-hmm. them, right then anyone that responded then I would talk to but I wouldn't actually talk to them I had this like weird tricks I could just hit a couple buttons on my phone and my phone would automatically respond to them if I on my phone and if you can see if I type in 111 and if I'll still do it 111 and It'll oh, the whole message. The assistant would send the invite. The people would respond if they're interested. If they're interested, we would start a conversation. Mm-hmm. If they weren't interested, I didn't say, I'm like, okay, cool, thanks. And then move on. And then my mm-hmm. assistant would just invite them again next month. So I'm like, so excited to hear back from you. So how it works is I get everyone set up with the tools they need to reach their goals, workouts, meal plans, blah, blah, blah. Like, ugh, <laughs> so gross. And like these people, what's shitty, what makes me feel awful is like, I have so many people who to this day, like reach out to me on social media because they feel like they've made a genuine connection with me over Instagram and the entire time I've been faking it. I think that it's very common to feel that way, like leaving an MLM and looking back and being like, why did I do the things that I did or kind of how you're feeling? It's hard (laughs) to look back and be like, okay, now wait, hindsight's 2020. I'm looking back. Nothing makes sense. Why did I do these things? In my opinion, MLMs are exactly like cults. You're going to do things that you wouldn't normally do. But on top of that, everything you just shared, can I just say thank you for sharing that? Um, That's not easy to share everything that happened with your mental health and everything. But if we add that on top of an MLM, it's like what happened was going to happen and you kind of can work through that. But you went through a lot. And I feel like that on top of kind of what an MLM teach you and what they train you, training you to work 24 seven. So that on top of mental health, it's like now I'm really working 24 seven, all of that mixed together. And then probably what were you hopping on? Like team calls all the time back then and stuff. And you're told like, you need to work 24 seven, you need to tend times your business tracker, like you said before. 
So you're yeah. constantly being told these things and you're definitely valid and feeling that way, like looking back at old messages and being like, fuck, I wish I didn't like message these people. Well, and like for the last year and a half or so, like I will like go to send somebody a message or like respond to something in their stories. And then I immediately stop. I stop sending the message because I look at the last message I sent them. I'm like, oh fuck, I don't want them to see that. Like I don't want to remind oh. them of what a douchebag scummy person I was a year ago. And, it, and it's so awkward too when like I'll go to like message someone about something legitimate like hey um where'd you get your shoes something actually worth messaging mm-hmm. someone for and I'll look back and see how many times they like ghosted my cold messages but like what made it easy for me to do that was I wasn't the one sending the cold message I think I, I think I was watching one of Chelsea's videos this morning mm-hmm. about like Jesse Lee talking about how she has assistants and she's like, I don't get told no, my assistants do. And I was just like, damn. I then I would go on team calls yeah. and tell people on our, on our team, like, I mean, you guys just aren't inviting enough. Just invite more, invite more. Like, I'm tired of being told no. I'm like, go for no, get as many no's as possible. Like all the shit that were preached in all the books, all like the GoPros and the 10X rules and all of the business guru book, I was doing all those things and saying all those things and repeating all those things. Then the hard work I didn't want to do. feel in MLMs, that's kind of what happens. When you're at the bottom, you're kind of trying to work your way up. So you're having to do everything because most people that get recruited are recruited in a vulnerable way 99% of the time. So these people are people who are already struggling in other aspects of life. So they're like, I'm really trying to make this work. And then as you work your way up, you're probably convinced or told, or you've heard people talk talk about we'll just hire an assistant or hire someone to send those DMs. So I know I heard it in Beachbody, like, oh, I have an assistant who does that. And then all they do is make the graphics for their team page or something. It is very common that that's happening. And like, I was never like a top, top, like wildly successful coach. So could I afford to be spending that money on an assistant? And an assistant? No, like I should not have, like, no. Mm-hmm. But I had a lot of friends because, you know, they always say like, surround yourself, like with your circle of five or whatever, like the five people you spend the most time with are like, who you are or some shit and so I only surrounded myself with like successful coaches so my upline was a top 10 coach we have another top 10 coach I guess like on our sideline so you were surrounded by those really top reps like those were the things you were hearing and those are the people that I would like spend my time with you know if I was even if I wasn't like interacting with like my upline I was talking to the top coaches on our team like my my circle of people that I interacted with are just like the people that were hitting successful every month going on the trips and rank advancing and doing the things and then you kind of just try and replicate (laughs) what they're doing like did you feel like okay how can I just replicate what that person's doing so that I could get there because you were surrounded by all the people at the top. Exactly. So I'm surrounded by all these like top people who know the secret spots. I hung out with them, not just like as like, oh, like let's get on a team call. It's like, let's connect and talk about how to grow my business. Like, no, like I would, I would go spend the weekend with my upline and just like hang out and have a girls weekend. So I knew some of these people on a more intimate level. So I was like, okay, we're like over drinks. Like, okay, real talk. What the fuck do I actually have to do to be successful? Like, what do you do? Show me, show me exactly what you're doing. And that's when I, so when I saw, I'm like, okay, a virtual assistant is doing this. Okay. Running ads, getting leads from the ads, having a virtual assistant contact those people and then automated responses, having scripts. The things that are on the business activity tracker are not it. Like <laughs> 10, 10 invites a day. No, you're not going to do shit doing that. You're sending an absurd amount of DMs to people to recruit. Yeah. And before anybody watching this is like, well, obviously what you're doing works. So like the business works. No, like I did the things that worked, that worked enough to like make me sort of successful, like compared to what I was successful compared to people who weren't getting a paycheck. But like, I'm not, I was not successful compared to like me now working a regular job. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a good point. Successful compared to what? I was top in the top, like one or 2% of Beachbody, but like still barely making ends meet. Like not, Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing anything exceptionally awesome with my life. I just so happened to have a husband at the time, divorced now, who believed in me enough to support my dreams. And if I couldn't pay a bill, he would just bitch about it and pay it. And that happens with a lot of people. And you do make a good point about the success to what? Because that's what we hear all the time. Like, oh, I'm successful. What are you successful compared to? Like, if we look at what's happening in your MLM, you're saying, oh, I'm successful because I'm taking the money from 99% of people under me who are never going to get where I am. 
And then every week on these team calls, I'm convincing them they could get this too. And here's some more motivation. And here's this and that every single week. It's like, so what, what is the version of success you're saying? Every cent and every dollar or anything that I made had to go into pretending that I had this awesome lifestyle Mm -hmm. where like the lifestyle I was presenting at the time is still not even as good as the lifestyle I'm currently living now, just going to work nine to five and like having paid vacations and paid time off and Mm -hmm. really benefits. I love working nine to five. Um, It's stressful too. It's hard too. like work is work, but I will say I guess for this video, like, I'm mainly speaking towards the girls that had like a little bit of success in MLMs. But we talk so much about the people that lose money or never make any money. Like, obviously, I'm sure if I did an expense report, I probably lost money too. But like mm-hmm. the people that like very clearly did not make a dime, never got a paycheck. We speak a lot to those people. But I feel like we don't talk enough about the girls who do make $500 a week, who do make $1,000 a week, who do make $1,500 a week. Like, okay, those are decent paychecks, but it's pre-tax mm-hmm. money. How much are you putting back into your MLM? And also how hard are you working? Like you're spending so much time on personal development, professional development, learning social media, learning how to, learning new scripts, creating new scripts, learning all the things that it takes to learn. Imagine if you put that much energy literally anywhere else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, At my job, I work for a coffee company. I started out as a barely above minimum wage employee, base level. Mm -hmm. Three months later, I was promoted for the first time, which is pretty fast. And then promoted since then, I've been promoted a total of four times. And I've only worked for the company now two years. Mm -hmm. But in a year and a half, I was promoted more working for a coffee company. Yes, we do talk a lot about like, okay, the people at the bottom. But for you, you see everyone, okay, she made a thousand dollar paycheck this week, but they never talk about what they're spending it on. So I know like my upline would do that. Like she would make like a thousand dollars. She would show us like her paycheck, but then she'd spend like $500 on an ad. So it's like, are they actually, even the people who get to the middle, when we look at, so I'm not talking about like someone who's making a million dollars a year. I'm like someone in the middle who seems to be making like, okay, 500 to a thousand a week. After that, it's like, okay, what are you spending it on though? Because they'll just tell you, we'll put more into ads, put more into this. Oh, you need to, now you need an assistant. Yeah. And then there's something else I'm going to say too. Um, oh, so like now you're just like, what are we spending? What else are we spending the money on? But like, we don't talk about, at least for me, because I didn't have a strong leg because my original upline stopped working the business. I was signed up on an inside leg of hers. Mm-hmm. And so I had no volume coming in from my upline. So I didn't get like the massive team, team cycle bonuses. The money I made was money that I had to go out and just make mm-hmm. or get my team to like hustle and make. So... You know, I always shouted myself out when I had a good, nice, juicy paycheck, but never did I talk about the $17 paycheck. So it sometimes would sprinkle their way into my life. I'm like, okay, I made $1,000 this week, $17 next week. So thriving. <laughs> never talked about this $17. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> no one's doing that. You do not no. see an MLM rep out there being like $5. Uh, never. <laughs> And like, I remember like, I would, I would feel so good about myself. I'm like, man, I am like, I'm climbing my way up. And, and the thing that kept me in for so long is mm. every top coach that I was friends with or like elite coach or premier coach that I was friends with, they're like, you're so close. Like you're so like, you're just right on the cusp. Like, don't get like, no, you're, you're so freaking close. Like just stick with it. And so I'm like, all right what harm in sticking with it? I'm already here. Mm-hmm. But those $17 paychecks, oh my God, I'd be, I'd be like, oh, I'm doing so great. I'm so excited. And then the next week I'm like, are you $17? Because I, I took a week to breathe because I like That's went to a doctor's appointment. Before ridiculous. this, this morning, I went through and like looked at all like my, like the former like paychecks that I'd gotten. Uh, I pulled up my phone. I was like, holy shit. There were a lot of weeks where I made like $17. Mm-hmm. And I was pretending like the thousand dollars every week. I mean, no, it it could be one or the other. I have a really great week followed by a really shitty week. So average. I like- feel like this is why, and I've taught like mentioned it before. It's just a theory of mine that I feel like MLMs pay these reps weekly. So like every Thursday or whatever, most MLMs pay you every single week. So they mm-hmm. use that to like promote. Well, guess what? You get a paycheck every week here. But when you think about it, okay, that paycheck is probably seventeen dollars. <laughs> but on top of that, it's like I feel they do it. So you can't notice 
how much you're not making. Because if every week you're like not really paying attention to the ad you just placed and like, you're just excited because, oh, I just got who reached out to me. I I didn't even have to reach out to them because I placed an ad or something. You like forget that $250 ad and you're like, oh, I made $17 this week. And then next week you're like, I made 50, but it never really adds up. Like the, your expenses end up being way more than what you're making. But when you get paid weekly, it feels like you're earning so much more than you actually are. If you're not doing, you know, your actual taxes and looking at everything, like what's coming in, what is going out. So like, yeah, they like pay you weekly, like with Beachbody, you get a paycheck once a week. So you can't tell just how little you're making because you see a thousand dollars like oh cool i make a thousand dollars a week but then there's other companies i think like money i think they pay monthly and i think the logic behind that is like okay all your commissions all your bonuses are lumped into one check so it looks mm. big it looks bigger but i don't know of any mlms that pay bi-weekly because we all know what a bi week what, what a good bi-weekly paycheck looks like because most of us who have worked any job ever mm-hmm. are familiar with a bi-weekly paycheck so if i got a bi-weekly paycheck and it was like you know 500 bucks instead of like the thousand like it was just like evened out i'm like oh and that could be why like i to this day have not seen an mlm that pays bi-weekly so that's why i feel like there's a method to what they're doing like there's a method to the mlm and when they went through everything the ceos whoever did it in corporate they looked at it and was like okay this is what we need to do to make this happen and it's like oh pay them every week or whatever it is to make it look like they're making so much more and nobody talks about taxes either so in Beachbody did people talk about taxes did you get any hey make sure you're taking out this amount any trainings nothing no hey look at your expenses versus what you're making no no that was never brought up (laughs) it would have been nice to have someone informing me of how to take that stuff seriously and to like know what I'm doing and you know I'm a business owner I should probably know how to do some basic accounting Yeah, I didn't know the tax stuff either until I like officially left. And I was like, now I understand why Mm -hmm. I never had to pay because I was always in the negative. So whenever I gave everything to like my tax person, I was always in the negative. So I never had to pay them. If you're in the positive, like the top reps are paying thousands of dollars to the IRS at the end of the year, beginning of the next year. But it's like when you're at the bottom or even the middle and you bring all that stuff to your tax person, you're probably not paying anything because you unfortunately were in the negative. Well, and so I will say I, I did do things a little bit differently with my business. I found a few little loopholes to spend less money but hey you know what if you're gonna if you are gonna stay for anyone watching who refuses to leave Beachbody because you just you know you're gonna make it and you don't care about scamming people um just an FYI buying Shakeology is actually optional um to stay active you just have to sell $50 for the product you don't have to buy $50 for the product so if you're already hitting success club and you're like dead set on just like staying in don't spend any money don't buy Shakeology I would go several months without buying Shakeology not even gonna lie I'm not drinking this shit every day it's an overpriced protein shake I'm gonna buy it every other month or any month that I can afford it and if I didn't hit like my minimum like income goal I wouldn't buy Shakeology like my reward for hitting my income goals was buying Shakeology uh and then for success club like you have to have 90 pv and hd to qualify for success club but like that's just if you want like the recognition of like success club all-star legend whatever oh, but to yeah. go on success club trips you don't have to buy Shakeology or have any pv requirements so I never bought Shakeology unless I just wanted to buy Shakeology. I stayed active through my customers and I still earned all the success club trips. I just yeah. sometimes lose my success club all-star status. And there was one year where I bought, I bought Shakeology every month just because I was making more money and I just wanted the title of success club all-star. But like when your upline is making the leaderboards, they're not checking people's volume to see who has yeah. Shakeology home direct. So I was still always on the leaderboards. I was like, I'm still getting my recognition here. People still think I'm awesome and getting all the praise and not wasting any more money in the process. Yeah. So looking, because I know you talked about already that you spent a lot of time, like endless amounts of time on the MLM. So looking back, do you think it was worth it? All the time you put in, do you feel the outcome was worth it? And we are back. Technical difficulties. Oh man. So where were we? Was it worth the time? Yes, yes. Was it worth it? (laughs) I would say, kind of like I was saying before it cut out, that I like to (laughs) see myself a little like glass half full versus half empty because I think if I chose to believe that I wasted the majority of my 20s, I would be very, very not happy. Um, That would be very depressing to think that I've wasted my youth in an MLM. So, and honestly, I didn't, it wasn't a waste of time because I've gained a lot of skills that I wouldn't have gained 
otherwise. Like the time that we spend like learning how to have conversations. Like I'm pretty comfortable like engaging with people, even though mm-hmm. I didn't, even in the last year, so I didn't have real conversations. But like I learned a lot about social media. I learned how to build my social media. I have a decently large social media account. I have an account with over 10,000 or 10,000 thousand followers but I have a social media account that I do every once in a while still get like actual sponsored brand deals with so like Mm -hmm. I'll have brands reach out to me and pay me crazy concept pay me to post their product (laughs) if only that was a thing and not be like hey we post this for free for a couple years and if you do it long enough and recruit other people then maybe we'll pay you a livable wage probably not so I I do my my I think my social media account is valuable which is nice to have I don't use it often but if I choose to later it'll be helpful to have Instagram with 10k plus followers on it and I'm also currently working for a coffee shop in the middle of a hiring and staffing crisis in the U.S. right now and one random skill I have is recruiting and so like the company that I work for has hired external recruiters to help managers um, get their store staffed and sometimes the recruiters are doing great and sometimes like they're just having a hard time as well And I actually um, had the opportunity to speak on like a area call with my boss's boss, Mm -hmm. sharing with like my boss and her peers how to recruit (laughs) to our business. And like, that's unheard of for someone like a manager who's extremely new in their role. Like I just got to this position. They're like, hey, we want you to help us recruit because I... I'm doing pretty well with that. While other stores maybe have like one or two applicants in their system. Mm-hmm. I currently have over 40 and my store is getting very well staffed and that's not common right now. So I think mm-hmm. that I have learned a lot of skills that I may or may not have learned, probably wouldn't have learned had I not been with Beachbody. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Like trying to look back and be like, okay, what can I take from it? Whether that's, I know never to join that shit again, or like something you could take with you. And for you, it's like, okay, I I did put myself out there on social media. I did reach out to people, you know, saying whatever the hell I was saying. So now you're comfortable talking with people and having conversations. So you can always look back and be like, okay, let me look at the thing that I actually got from it versus what it took for me and like when I'm hiring people now like I will you know whether it's on LinkedIn or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is like I will literally not quite hey girl a little bit more professional than that but I will just send like if I don't have applicants that I need I will go and look for the people that I want from like competitive competing who work in, in competing businesses or similar industries and reach out to them and say hey have you ever considered a job with this company mm-hmm. and the cool thing about that and why that doesn't feel gross is because the company that I work for will actually pay them to work for them. Like, and benefits, great benefits you have. <laughs> really great benefits. Like yeah. I started there because of the benefits. I started at this job as a minimum wage-ish employee, very bottom, while I was still coaching, while I was still coaching full-time, quote unquote, because I was turning 26. This is actually right after I got out of the psych hospital. I was on all these new meds. The medication I was put on without insurance was $1,500 a month. And so I was like, okay, I need insurance. So I Googled part-time jobs that offer insurance and this company came up and you don't have to be a full-time employee to get the benefits. The benefits are affordable and it's just a great company to work for. And then yeah. during the pandemic, while this is my turning point with Beachbody was um, how coaches handled the pandemic. Once the pandemic first started, the company that I work for was one of the first companies to send people home um, and pay them to be home for two months. So two and a half months. So during like, during like the actual quarantine phase of the pandemic, we were all sent home. Nobody was laid off. Nobody was fired. And we all got our full pay for two months while we were at home. They also gave, they kept a couple locations open so people can go. So employees could go and get free food and drinks every single day if they needed to. So they made sure that all the employees were fed, make sure everybody still got a paycheck, make sure our bills are still paid. They increased our mental health benefits, like 20, 20 free therapy sessions a year which I'm obsessed with that benefit now. And then like after those free benefits, like my insurance will cover those therapy sessions as well. Mm -hmm. They offer like childcare benefits, which is really important right now. 100% tuition covered for college. Like it's a really great company to work for. And seeing how well we were taken care of, how well I was taken care of as a bottom level, bottom tier employee, while on the flip side, when I would come home and work my beach body business, I was being pressured to like hound people for their stimulus checks. I was like, hmm, which 
which of these aligns more with my true values? And now that I was no longer battling my mental illness, but I was like stable and comfortable and like living a healthy, living with a full deck of cards, so to speak, Mm -hmm. I could no longer comfortably go on doing what I was doing, knowing that that there was no way that I wasn't hurting people. And like seeing it like our group chats, like leader chat chats, coaches literally saying like, hey, how are you guys leveraging stimulus checks right now? And I literally like lost my shit. <laughs> hey, for the love of God, don't do that. Like, I don't know what we're doing here, but we're not doing that. We're not leveraging the money that the government is putting into our economy so people can feed their fucking kids. Let's not do that. That was definitely one of the most enraging things when it came to my time watching MLM shit and like really being behind the scenes and being like, what in the hell? Because when you compare that to the job you work for now, it's like jobs will do that. And a lot of people in MLMs are trying to make it seem like, well, no, you join Beachbody and you'll get that freedom. It's like, no, you could work a normal job and you don't have to work in corporate. Like you don't work in corporate in a corporate building in a cubicle, like they always like to say. And it's like, you get all of these benefits, which all of those people in MLMs could get if they wanted to, they could go and get one of those jobs that are like with those really good benefits. So I am glad that you said something about that because I can't believe they were saying that but even then like I was still even though I I saw like the shady shit happening like I still like in 2020 so I took like most of 2019 off like my assistant was automating some stuff and I was still bringing some income but I focused on my mental health as a full-time job in 2019 then in 2020 I kind of was doing the same thing initially then the pandemic hit and then my job sent us all home and paid us all to take care of ourselves and I was like well I'm home not else nothing else to do gyms are closed let me see if I can revive my business let me see if I can get back into like the girl I was before and I tried for the first like month or so of the pandemic like once the gyms closed I had some record-breaking months for myself where I brought on more customers than I ever had before but it still never like sparked joy I guess I was just like oh cool money sweet and um then I think August of 2020 was a team cup month and I was I signed up for team cup I even like bought some like challenge group templates off of Etsy and I was like leading the team cup and we're like all prepping last like weekend or so in July getting ready for a team cup in August and then like something clicked and I just stopped I I didn't say anything I just like stopped so I didn't even I didn't even contribute like one successful point to team cup I was just like I'm not doing this And then I started finding videos like your videos and I found Kiki Chanel's videos actually way before then. I think Mm -hmm. it was like spring of 2020. One of like the first red flags, one of the many initial red flags because I knew the girls on that call and I was friends with girls on that call. And that was the hardest pill to swallow because like, no, there's no way to watch that call and think that's okay. Mm -hmm. And like, I literally have a matching tattoo on my body with a coach on that call. It's almost like, I feel like, like the Nexium people with like the tattoos. Like, oh yeah. Here, this tattoo. That's and crazy. Tattoo with the leader of that call. So do you feel when you were leaving, did you, or not when you were leaving, but I guess, yeah, that's what I'm meaning. Kind of when you were drifting out, did you lose any like relationships or kind of, was it just like, oh, she just doesn't want to do it anymore. Like, how did that go for you? I'm glad you asked that because, you know, I watched a lot of like your guys' videos and like that was like a recurring theme, like people talking about how they were like shunned or like, you know, bullied and treated poorly. And quite frankly, like I was terrified of that happening. And I witnessed that happen back in 2017 when several coaches on our team left for other companies, whether it be like the wine companies or Prove It, um, because that was when Beachbody On Demand was first becoming a thing. And Mm-hmm. A lot of OG old school coaches did not like Beachbody on demand and did not understand the concept of how that was going to make them money. So like Beachbody's going on there, whatever, we're leaving. And so there was like, that was nasty. The way, the way that that was handled was just nasty and vile. And like, I did not want to be on the receiving end of that. Not that I would have been, but I just, I wasn't, I knew that I was also at that time a year and a half ago, contemplating like sharing my story on social media, like my full mm-hmm. story. And I felt like if I had done that at that time and left at that time all at once, I think I would have had some negative backlash. I just, I just stopped. I just stopped. Po- I stopped posting. I stopped participating in the group chats. I didn't like remove myself. I just stopped responding and I muted them. I kind of like pulled back as quietly as possible. But what I noticed is a couple girls in like our like leadership push 
group chats, like one or two message me like, Hey, you haven't posted in the group chat. Like, are you still everything good? Are you, are you on board with what we're doing? And I'm, I can't remember if I ever responded. I think I might say like, oh, I'm just kind of doing my own thing right now. Um, but after that, no more check-ins from them. Honestly, there's only been one coach in the entire team who has like regularly checked in on me and like that I'm still friends with, like actually friends with. Um, and she's doing the same thing. She, like she and I kind of are on the same, she's my success partner and kind mm-hmm. of around the same time. She started dealing with some of her own personal issues and she kind of pulled back and kind of noticed the same thing. Like, wow, like I went from being a top recruiter on this team and a top contributor to this team and I disappear and like seemingly nobody cared. I think it's almost more heartbreaking that there's been so little response to me leaving because it shows me just how unimportant I actually was to the team. Mm-hmm. and how manufactured all the friendships were because these are people you call your sisters we go on retreats and unsuccessful club trips and on vacations and to each other's houses and travel with each other and in all of our posts we talked about like this is my ride or die this is my sister like mm-hmm. I don't know what to do thanks for this business it's brought me my best friends ever and then you have a friend that number one you know is struggling with their mental health because one I was taught to share the shit out of that with the internet. So oversharing on that, wonderful. It's been shared the entire public, like what I've been going through the last couple of years, but also as my friends, like they intimately know what I went through as well. Yeah. So it's just weird. I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question. It's just been weird. I feel comfortable talking about like coming out and sharing my story now because clearly no one cares. <laughs> Instead of like, oh, people talk shit about you. And it's the other side of that because that's not the only thing that happens. Sometimes there are great uplines that are just like, yeah, cool. Talk to you next week. Sometimes there are people that are friends with you, but most of the time it's you're shunned or then you realize none of this ever mattered. Like everything I was doing was because someone was earning a paycheck at the end of the day for me. And I think it is a sad thing to realize and kind of go through if you make those connections and then you realize like, fuck, well, what did, what did that mean to them? Cause clearly they're not even reaching out. There's some other stuff too. That's like, gets really deep and dark. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to like expose anyone. There's a lot to expose. There's a lot of shit that like, is not okay. One thing I can say, having several friends that were at or near the top is that none of their lives are what they portray on social media. Not a single one of them. Um, Most of them are struggling with their own mental health issues. Most of them are exhausted. Most of them are kind of shitty to their kids. And I'm not saying that any of them are like shitty moms. Yeah. Like they all try their best, but like, yeah, it's not like the perfect it's not the perfect life that they portray on the internet. And it's also like, again, I'm not a mom. So I can't, I'm not mom. Send me mom shaming. Like yeah. MLMs, like mom shame, non MLMers. Like, don't you just want to spend time with your kids? <laughs> well, okay. That's the thing. So MLMers will mom shame their audiences. Be like, I'm just so blessed that like, during the pandemic, I can hold on to my babies and just like make sure that they're all taken care of and know that mama's here. Cause I work so hard. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag love. <laughs> company and then at the same time while they're posting it their kids are in the background screaming like shut the fuck up I'm making a post about you it's not what it looks like on social media at all I have so many things I could share with you not on this video but no that's fine you're just pretty much saying yeah nothing is how it seems when you're behind the scenes and that's definitely something I've tried to talk about a lot or like tried to kind of show especially with WFAB if you followed that at all I really yeah. tried to hone in on like this is what they share online but like this is the call they never thought would get out or whatever because that is what happens they present a certain thing and then it's like that is not what's actually happening behind the scenes and it's shitty because I feel like social media in general does that but it's like heightened in MLMs it's like they use that to get to you versus like some people just share a highlight reel and that's like cool that's social media but they don't do that to like make money off you um but no I've never met a top coach that's actually happy ever and most of them are dealing with like really shitty circumstances at home to some degree and like they're forced to like portray this like fake lifestyle and oh yeah so I was telling you about how um the first time I went to go meet my upline at the time like so my initial upline she never really counted she like she was a discount coach the entire time. She signed me up because I was more so like ready to sign up. And I was like, hey, you want me to be, the co- be a coach? Cool. What do I do? Like I was like the eager person that's like, hey, let's just sign mm. me up. And then her upline, the one that left her prove it, actually ended up moving in because she was doing, she was a five-star diamond coach, by the way. Had to move in with my with her upline because she couldn't afford to live on her own with just her and her son. 
And so to avoid getting evicted out of her apartment, she moved in with our upline. And then the agreement with them was like, okay, well, she's going to be the nanny for all the kids in exchange for living here and I'll help her grow her business. And then she kind of like fucked her, fucked the, the top upline over and then left for prove it and took half the team with her and then moved out. It was a whole thing. That that was a whole thing. Um, but anyway, the first time I went to go visit both of them at the home they collectively lived in, I was closer friends with the lower upline. Mm-hmm. But the five star upline and our other upline was a 15 star upline. So me and the five star were close. And then she moves in with the 15 star. I go visit the five star and I was like, oh my gosh, we're at the 15 stars house. Like she's top 10. Oh my God. I feel just, this is so crazy. And I get there and I'm like, she's a regular, regular ass person. And I love her as a person. As a person, she's cool as shit. I was like, oh, you're just like a regular, you're a regular bitch like me. Like, <laughs> There's nothing different about, oh my, and then like I would hear interactions between her and her husband and her and her kids. I'm like, oh, you're all fucked up. And then like they have these neighbors that come over and like your neighbors are fucked up. You guys are all fucking fucked up. And like they talk about the same shit. They go through the same shit. They're the same as everybody else. And we put these like halos around them because they've got into an MLM early enough to be successful at it. And I have no hate in my heart whatsoever for my 15 star upline. So the five star left for prove it and then like, did some shady shit and left. And then I became really close with our 15 star. And like the 15 star, like made of honor my wedding. Like her husband shot the video for my wedding. And it was like, they saved my life when I was going through mental health crisis. Like I owe so much to them as friends. And I love them so much as friends to this day. I will always, always have like love for them. And she's reached out like once since I've kind of pulled back from the business. And I'm choosing not to read into that because I know, I know how hard it was for me to leave and how hard it's been for me to pull back. And like, sometimes my checks were $17. Mm -hmm. So I could not imagine if I've built this entire brand, this entire organization with thousands of people beneath me, thousands of people relying on me, thousands of people finding hope within my story. And like, I've seen the behind the the scenes of that story. Not to say it's not real. Everything she's been through is real. Everything that she's been through is hard as fuck. She's had a really, really challenging life and she's been through some shit and she's a strong ass person. But I feel like because our team has witnessed so much of her trauma, I feel like she owes it to them. I feel like she owes something to the team. She's like, you guys are there for me through X, Y, and Z in my life. Like I owe you. And like, I also feel like she... And I, I can't speak for her, but I also, but, but in my opinion, I think she's afraid of what her family's life would be without Beachbody. Mm. And she's not a top 10 coach anymore. Her, I think her mind, her focus is let me take care of my family because her family was never able to take care of her the way she does her kids. And honestly, like, I don't think it really even matters to her. Like, I think genuinely she hopes everyone is successful. And I think genuinely she's like, hey, this is what I did. Just fucking do it too. And I think a part of her believes that. But I think a part of her also is just like, I don't care. I got to take care of my kids. I have to take yeah. care of my husband. I have to take care of my life. I have to maintain this lifestyle and keep everything afloat because my husband doesn't work. I'm the primary breadwinner. This is where income, like, like Beachbody has fucked her so many times. Like they fucked her out of a $30,000 bonus. In what world and what other job would you stay after being told you're not getting a $30,000 $30, bonus that you, that you earned? I think that that's the toxic part of MLMs is while the people at the top, like when we break it down, you're scamming people and that is what's happening. But when you think about it, they also like those people are putting like, oh, well, I was also convinced of this, this and this. And now they rely on it. Like they have their spouse quit their job. It's like you do all this and you put yourself in a position to like not be able to get out if you wanted to. Well, and the crazy thing is like her husband's a a professional photographer. She is incredibly engaging and interesting if they wanted to start a youtube channel they could monetize that immediately she i mean she has sponsored posts i'm pretty sure from other companies like she could just do like regular influencer shit for her it is consistent enough income it's consistent income she knows how to do it it's what she knows it's how she built her platform um i think there are two different types of like people at the top i think mm-hmm. you have other people like jesse lee ward who very aware of how network marketing works, very aware that like, it's going to take scamming some people to get where you got to go, but the hustlers are going to hustle and the losers are going to lose, so to speak. And then I think they're the top coaches who are just like regular people like you and I, who got in at the right time, who are charismatic enough, who are good enough at doing the things and creative enough to like create their own path. And 
achieve the impossible, but at their core, they're still just like regular people like you and I. And once they get to that top level, they're like, Mm -hmm. I can't leave if I wanted to, because I'm getting paid way too much money to do what I'm doing. I've celebrated that my husband is now quote unquote retired. And yeah, I, I don't know. I don't envy those people. Like you said, that person could probably start a YouTube channel. They probably have a great platform as it is where it's like they have a engaging following, but they're not seeing that. Like they're not allowing themselves to see that because they're so stuck in the, but I need to just keep doing what I'm doing. It's making me money. So she probably feels like, oh, I need to keep filling these slots and doing it. And I, I don't have another route and it does suck because she probably could be doing influencing more than anyone I know. Like when I would go spend weekends with her, we would just like work all weekend and we'd have Mm -hmm. fun and have a good time. And she has a great life. Like, I'm not saying like, oh, it just, it sucks. They're, they're lying. With, she, have, she does have a great life, but she works her ass off all the time. And as a part of the million dollar club and a 15 star, you know, multiple time top 10 coach, you would think at that point, you'd be able to like take time off. And like, she has taken little bits of time off for like family emergencies and things like that. But like right now she should be able to just like coast and just survive but she's not she's replenishing people like myself and like my friend that were top top recruiters for her downline that no longer do that and like she's constantly replacing people and it's not a matter of like she not being good good enough of a leader like it, it, it's not about that it's like the business isn't designed for us yeah. to, do to get where you are I, I know a part of her believes that like oh well, people just do what I did they'll get here too but I also, but also think because she's working so hard to constantly keep replacing people that inevitably leave in an MLM, what she doesn't have time to do is look at where social media really is as a career at this point. Like when yeah. I in the MLM, I never listened to music. It sounds stupid, but I realized, I realized after my divorce, actually this summer, I'm like, wow, this is the first time I, I listen to music constantly now. Like, I'm like, this is the first time I've ever been able to like, listen to music. Like my husband didn't like my music, style, like didn't have the same taste in music as me. And with the MLM, I didn't have time to do anything, mm. but the MLM. So I didn't have time to realize how lucrative YouTube was as a career. Like the last time I had time to like watch things on YouTube prior to the MLM, that was back when like YouTube was all like tutorials and like, yeah. Blogging. To my knowledge, there were no commentary channels at the time that I started the MLM. Yeah. So, and, and like, and to me, like YouTube was like an app that kids watched like little music videos on their phone. I didn't realize it was yeah. whole, like ecosystem of like content <laughs> that you could create on this platform, but it's because I didn't have time to do anything but invite thousands of people to my challenge groups. Yeah. And so I think that's part of it too with her is like she could take her skills and run with them in a million directions. Like I have a frac, I had a fraction of the success that she had in the the business. And I've been able to take what I've learned as a coach and do some pretty awesome things with it too. And she has a professional photographer as a husband and like all these things and all the resources, all the, all the financial resources. Like they, I will say they, to my knowledge, from what I understand from them, they aren't the couple that's like making all this money and then like spending it as fast as they earn it. So to my understanding, like they've got a little safety net. Okay. Like they have, she, she's in a very privileged position where like she could step away, figure some shit out. But I think, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of mental work that would have to come with that too, because it's traumatic. Yeah. Like leaving an MLM is traumatic. Like leaving, a, it's leaving a cult. Yeah, it is hard. So the last question I want to ask just really quickly, and then we can kind of end it is where did you see most of your money come from? I love to ask people this because it could be different for everyone. But like, if you looked at your paycheck, where did most of your income come from at the end of the day? Was it sales team cycle bonus? Where did you so see that? Mine were typically, um, I'm trying to think what the category was like, there's a, a category for like, if you sold challenge packs, just like retail commissions. Mm-hmm. And then I signed everyone up as a coach. That's just like what I was taught to do. So I had a lot of the like the fast time. start bonus. Yeah. 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 So I just like would recruit my ass off and, and I would just sign everyone up as a coach. And most of them never worked as coaches. Most of them were like, I don't know why I'm here. And I'm like, cool, you're a coach. <laughs> <laughs> I need to maintain. My yeah. Life. I can get team cycle bonuses. My team cycle bonuses, there was a point where they were like decent, but they were never great. Most of my stuff was retail and then beach by on demand subscriptions. Um, so is there anything else you want to say before we end the interview call chat? <laughs> hmm. If you're in an MLM and you think that anti MLMers are haters, I feel you. I thought the same thing. I hate watch 
Deanna for a while. I hate watched Chelsea for a while. I hate watched you guys. So watching your video on why you quit Beachbody and watching um, Josie from Not the Good Girl, mm-hmm. why she left the MLM at the top, which was Beachbody and was it Cinegents? Oh, I don't remember, but I know Beachbody was one of like the three. I think she got up in three MLMs. Yeah. 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 Hearing specifically like, stories about Beachbody was what like kind of did it for me and everyone always says like videos like hey if you're unsure like do a expense report analysis my thing is hey go through the bite model see if you're yeah let me know and be honest with yourself and also like don't be like I I still carry so much shame it's I've never really talked to anybody about it like my mom wanted to come over today she's like hey what are you doing I'm like oh I'm doing an interview for YouTube today she's like for what and then (laughs) I told her and she was like oh like I didn't really realize that you left Beachbody because like I haven't told anybody I just yeah. kind of disappeared and stopped talking about it and I've never addressed it with my audience I my one friend that I said I, like my coach friend that's I'm still friends with she came and visited me um right after my divorce and she and I talked about it and she and I both were like feeling a lot of like anxiety being on social media and anxiety around just how do we talk about this how do we tell people that for years we were like gung-ho about do this thing with us and now we're like never mind sorry that was whoops like don't pay attention to those last five years and so what she and I did together is we went through and we archived all of our beach body fo- like posts on our Instagram and it was so liberating to, like have our social media accounts back I'm like okay this feels more like me again but anyway like if you're in an MLM maybe don't get out right now but just be open to listening and just because what you're doing is being accused of being a scam does not mean that everything that you're learning and everything that you have done up to this point has been a waste of time and like for me like I I I had a really hard time coming to grips with like the thought like did I just waste five years of my life like it's not wasted you've learned something whether it be a tangible skill or just something about yourself and whatever you're not getting paid to do here someone out there will pay you a lot of money just for you being you and just know that you're worth more like I think Chelsea I agree so you're worth so much more than what the MLM is giving you I agree. I love that. It's like the perfect ending. (laughs) So thank you for being on and sharing your story and being so open about everything. Because I know talking about things like mental health is not at all like an easy thing to talk about, especially after leaving an MLM on top of everything that you feel on that. It's like not an easy thing to talk about. So thank you. Okay, you guys, I probably look wild right now, but I've just been spending the last like four to five hours editing this interview and noticed I didn't have an intro. And I do this after every interview I've done so far. I forget to do the outro to the video. So here I am. So thank you so much to the individual who allowed me to interview them today. I am not gonna say her name because I do not know 100% if she wants her first name out there yet. So I'm not gonna say that or give you guys her first name, but thank you so much for allowing us to interview you today. And honestly, just being so so open about everything you went through. I know it's not easy at all to speak about things like mental health or in general to speak about an MLM experience. It's not an easy thing to do. So every single person who messages me or emails me or actually gets on an interview and tells their stories, thank you, thank you so much. And I always know that interviews like this can help a lot of people who are still in the MLM or maybe even people who have gone out of their MLM but are going through the same things mentally that this person may have gone through. And I'm going to be continuing to to do interviews probably once a month, just like I do MLM Horror Stories once a month. So I'm very excited to see who the next person is that I'm interviewing. I think it's a Primerica rep. So that's exciting or like an ex Primerica rep. So if you want to get interviewed, I will have my email down below. Just make sure in the subject line when you email me to say interview, like I'd like to get interviewed so I can put it in my interview folder of all the people who email me. So yeah, that's going to be all. I hope you guys have an amazing day. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And I will see you guys in the next video.